Um, as program director over the last year or so, um, I've had the pleasure of getting to know these four girls. Uh, we have Amber Athey from Georgetown University, who went to our Texas summit. And before that, she helped bring um, Dr. Christina Hoff Summers to Georgetown. And um, it was a very eventful lecture, as I'm sure she'll tell us a little more about. Um, she spoke on it at the Texas summit, but since then, there's been even more on our campus, so uh, she's gonna go into that. And then we have Elizabeth Campbell from Virginia Tech University, uh, who will be interning with us this summer. And she helped bring Kate Obenshane to her campus um, this past fall. Then we have Andrea Vagiano, who as a high school stu student actually attended our Minnesota summit last year, and got involved with us, and she, I'm proud to say, will be interning with us this summer. Um, and then Anna Lippincott, who was one of our interns this past summer, uh, will be talking about her lecture with Dr. Christina Hoff Summers as well. So I'm gonna turn it over to Amber um, to start us off. Oh, I didn't realize the first step. Um, thank you, Laurel, for your kind introduction. Um, as Laurel said, I had the opportunity to speak at the um, Fall Summit, and I'm really excited to be able to share my experiences with a new group of fellow conservative women. Um, if you've been paying attention, it is no secret that over the past couple of years, there has been a trend among campus liberals to silence and shame young conservatives. The wave of trigger warnings, safe spaces, and microaggressions have being doled out by the left are hampering free speech by painting conservatives as bigoted, racist, offensive, and so on. When people can't combat the logic of your arguments, they choose to call you names instead. I witnessed these things in action when with the help of the Claire Booth Luce Policy Institute, I brought Dr. Christina Hoff Summers to campus. Feminists and pro-choicers on campus considered Dr. Summers to be a rape apologist and anti-feminist, so they heavily protested the event and demanded I issue trigger warnings and safe spaces to protect their fragile feelings. A talk on feminism is obviously not psychologically damaging to anyone, so the requests for trigger warnings were clearly just a ploy to designate the speaker as different and therefore not worth listening to. Drawing on my experiences with Dr. Summers, I decided to write an article for the Georgetown University College Republicans blog called No Climate for Conservatives. I wanted to discuss the way conservatives had been ridiculed, shamed, and shut down by campus leftists. I was hoping by identifying this issue that I could both encourage fellow conservatives to stand up for their beliefs and also tell uh, liberals that their behavior was wrong. Unfortunately, since writing the article, it seems that this problem has only gotten worse. Drawing on my, oh, excuse me, over the past couple of weeks, militant uh, feminists and social justice warriors have personally targeted and attacks, attacked members of the Georgetown University College Republicans. One friend of mine had a conservative poster set on fire while it was still hanging on his door. A member of the College Republicans board came home one night to find that her door had been covered in lube and her posters defaced with profanity. Neighbors on her floor told her that while she was gone that evening, two boys had paraded down her hallway yelling degrading things about her and conservatives in general. Another board member had her apartment broken into that very same night. The left on campus has clearly evolved to a more radical and frankly frightening ideology. Previously, they only wanted to silence speech that they disagreed with. Now, they find it justifiable to respond to perceived offenses with force. You may have recently seen a video of a social justice warrior dragging and pulling a white male down the stairs for daring to wear dreadlocks. While the less attempts to shut down free speech were enraging, their move to violence and intimidation is much worse and very scary. Now conservatives not only must fear verbal bullying, but also physical retaliation. As a conservative woman, this is especially concerning because we've never fit in. Self-proclaimed feminists have decided that conservative women are irrelevant because they don't buy into the pro-choice, wage gap, sexism narrative that the left chooses to propagate to victimize women. Much like black conservatives are considered Uncle Toms by the left, conservative women are traitors that exist only to propagate the 
imagined war on women. Feminism has made women like us the enemy, and it's not hard to envision that they will continue to use this as an excuse to justify attacks. Recently, conservative commentator Lauren Southern had a bottle of urine dumped on her head for daring to talk to protesters and say something that they didn't like. Given all of this, why would anyone want to be a campus conservative activist? It certainly sounds like a raw deal. Um, I became a student activist because I asked myself, if I don't do this, then who will? The only way to combat the increasingly aggressive left is to create a strong group of unapologetic conservatives that care more about standing up for their principles than the potential backlash. If we give in to the bully pulpit, we lose. I'm not interested in being politically correct. I'm interested in finding the truth. And in order for the truth to prevail, conservatives must take back college campuses. My friend still has the half-burned poster hanging on his dorm room as a reminder that we will not back down. Thank you. Thank you so much, Amber. Next, I'll have Elizabeth from Virginia Tech. Hi, everyone. Like Laurel said, my name is Elizabeth. I go to Virginia Tech. And when I began college, I didn't expect everything to be one-sided. And by one-sided, I mean liberal. I grew up learning to respect others' opinions, and unfortunately, I was not having the same respect given to me by my peers or my professors. By the end of my first semester of school, I was beginning to question my values, and I knew something needed to give. Luckily, early on in my second semester of school, I met Lauren McHugh, a former CBLPI intern and the chairman of a conservative group on my campus. Very early on, Lauren encouraged me to attend conservative conferences, get involved with activism projects, and help ad advertise for speaking events. I finally felt like I wasn't such a minority after all. Lauren taught me so much about activism and, and prepared me so well to tackle the left on campus for when she graduated this past fall and I took over her position as chairman of the group. She always told and still tells me to be bold and strong with whatever I do. And I'm so glad I can have the opportunity she had a few years ago to intern at CBLPI this summer. Right before she graduated, Lauren and our group decided to bring Kate Obenshane to campus as our CBLPI sponsored speaking event for the semester. I had the opportunity of hearing Kate speak over the summer and was excited to help with the process of bringing her to campus. I had recently been voted into the chair position to replace Lauren when she graduated, so this was my first real hands-on experience hosting a speaker. We titled the event The Left's War on Women and advertised it as a critique of the modern feminist movement, making flyers, a Facebook event, emailing professors and department groups to spread the word around campus. Somehow the event ended up on the campus feminist group's Facebook page, where the first comment was, I would love to come and fact check as well as correct misrepresentations and generally provide a more accurate portrayal of the feminist movement. Thanks for the invite. This was followed by another comment from an alumni saying, I especially don't agree that a Fox News commentator is the best source for a critique of fourth wave feminism or culture surrounding healthcare, which I thought was ironic since Kate Obenchain was also the first woman chair of the Virginia GOP. Around the same time that we were promoting the event, our campus SGA was promoting a campaign for Halloween entitled, My Culture is Not a Costume, AKA Halloween is cultural appropriation and this is how we're gonna take the fun out of it. <laughs> our group came up with the came out with a statement on why it was a ridiculous campaign, then hosted a funeral for Halloween, <laughs> mocking the campaign, just as something lighthearted and fun, including an obituary for Halloween that we passed out with candy and a coffin filled with costumes that were considered cultural appropriation. This ended up fueling Kate's event, with her spe spending more time discussing First Amendment violations on college campuses, political correctness, speech codes, and in the end, tying in how sex weeks, V-days, and the hookup culture is detrimental to women. The same girl that said she was going to come fact check the event did come with her computer to fact check Kate. When the event ended, she asked one of her first questions, creating more of a monologue for her opinions than a question that demanded an answer. 
At one point, Kate asked for clarification and the girl interrupted her saying, excuse me, I am speaking now. She gave Kate a question dealing with personal encounters with people coming up and telling others that dressing as their culture was offensive, which Kate knocked down and answered eloquently, discussing how issues like this should be kept on a person-to-person -person basis and not be included in a school's policy. However, the girl proceeded to keep asking questions more and more. At one point, she even went into this dialogue about her place of privilege, apolo apologizing for her upper middle class, white, cisgender female background. We all needed a little, a little clarification on what cisgender meant, including Kate, who asked. Finally, Kate had enough, as well as everyone else in the room, and told the girl that she would talk to her afterwards for as long as she wanted. But it was, uh, but it was other people's turns to ask questions. The girl did not stay after to talk to Kate. The left may talk a big game, like all the women on the feminist page did and the girl fact-checking fact Kate did, but they never come out strong in person because they're too afraid to continue the conversation and deal with facts. Kate has taught me a few things during her speech as tech as well as other times I have heard her speak. One of the most important, thing, one of the most important is that no matter how hard things get or how much backlash you receive for having controversial beliefs, don't give up. She gives a speech about a day where she felt like giving up, but past the church that Patrick Henry gave his famous give me liberty or give me death speech in, and this made all of her complaints about being tired of fighting for conservatism that day feel pretty petty compared to the bravery of the founding fathers willing to give up their lives to form this nation. Just recently, I made sure to keep this in mind when I felt like giving up. I just hosted my first speaking event as chair of my group, and got a lot of backlash for the title of the event and the way we were promoting it, not only from peers on campus that I did not know, but friends, as well as one member of the group who was publicly going against our values while still trying to promote our event. One day, I was so tired of hearing people complain to me and dealing with rude comments that I just wanted to tell someone else to deal with it, but I didn't. Instead, I remembered Kate's speech and her talking to us at dinner before her event on campus about how much more rewarding it is to pursue something you are passionate about without worry over other, what other people think. Everything we do as conservatives on liberal campuses is controversial. We are a minority group going against a majority in a bold way. The best thing to do is just shake off the negativity and remember how many people you could be influencing by, bring, by being that conservative voice for your peers. The room for my event ended up being completely filled with a line going up the stairs in the building and people standing outside trying to pay others $50 for a seat or crowding to the doors to hear the speaker, a conservative speaker. It is so much more rewarding to know that you influenced others to be vocal about their conservative values on campus or that you changed a, member, a few members of the left's mind by bringing a conservative speaker to campus to expose a different view not normally seen. At the same event, other conservatives who were not members of our group came up to ask questions. More than the left tried to counter the speaker. And it was so rewarding to know that I influenced them to be vocal about their beliefs. Get connected with groups like Claire Blue Loose to bring speakers to campus. Hosting an event is probably the most rewarding experience you could have as a collegiate activist. Even if you can't change the minds of every single person in the room, you might be able to give the courage to one closet conservative to be more vocal, who can go challenge the left, giving you one more person on your campus to fight the good fight. Excellent job, Elizabeth. Next, I'll invite Andrea from Rutgers University up to the stage. Or Hi everyone, uh, I just wanna thank Laurel and CBLPI for letting me speak with you today. My name is Andrea Vasciano and I'm a freshman at Rutgers University and like most of you, I go to a liberal school. At Rutgers, there are five campuses on New Brunswick. So I live on the all women's campus, um, which is predominantly feminist. Uh, it hasn't been a great experience and even though Douglas is meant to be a safe space, it really only exists to make certain women feel safe. For example, one of my friend's roommates told me that my views hurt women after seeing that I had a Young Americans for Liberty sticker in my room. 
Uh, another time, I had gotten into a conflict with my roommate, and her friends knew that I was a conservative, so they would loudly walk by my door and talk about how they thought that religion was dumb and how much they wanted to get abortions just for the fun of it because they thought it would offend me. This is really when I wasn't vocal about my views, and I only had a few political stickers in my room. So it's really indicative of how conservatives are targeted on college campuses, especially conservative women. But I can't say that they didn't have the right to challenge my opinion, and I'm gl actually glad that they did because they solidified my beliefs and proved to me that the leftists that only resort to petty attacks don't deserve to be taken seriously. But even living on a feminist campus didn't prepare me enough for when I helped to host Milo Yiannopoulos at Rutgers. I don't know how many of you are familiar with Milo, but basically he's a very flamboyant, charming, provocative, conservative journalist who writes for Breitbart. He's famous for being really politically incorrect, and someone in my Yale chapter got in touch with him and invited him to speak at Rutgers. Uh, very generously, Milo accepted and sent us posters to spread around campus. Uh, um, to advertise the event. They were a bit cheeky, saying things like feminism is cancer or prepare to get triggered, and so we anticipated <laughs> backlash. But we were really excited that such a pro-free speech speaker was going to come to speak at Rutgers and counter the leftism. Uh, Noam Chomsky had spoken the previous October, and the last time Rutgers invited a conservative speaker, Condoleezza Rice, uh, the students and faculty got so angry that they had to rescind her invitation. Milo's also very funny, and his persona is a bit outlandish, so we were looking forward to it. Uh, fast forward to the day of the event, which ended up being a logistical nightmare. It generated so much buzz that many people, that too many people signed up for it, and there were uh, 200 people over the room limit. The line stretched outside for about half a mile, it was snowing, and I was one of the members whose job it was to get people in. I had to deny a few people for not having valid tickets, and some of them implied that I was a racist for not letting them in, even though I had to turn away many, many other people. Um, two girls uncomfortably pressed me about my views on feminism, asking if I knew that Milo was, wasn't a feminist, as if I identified as one on, after being told that my beliefs hurt women on day one of college, and they would laugh when I told them that I did in fact know that Milo wasn't a feminist. And we had to turn away a lot of people away who actually wanted to see Milo, and some of the protesters snuck in anyway, so that was a bit of a headache as well. Uh, I was really stressed out, so as the event was starting, my YAL president felt a bit sorry for me and introduced me to Milo, who gave me a hug and was really nice and insisted that I sit in the front to watch the lecture. Uh, I was really happy, and I thought that my worries were over as the lecture started, but, and everything was okay until about seven minutes in, I heard a voice behind me say, this man represents hatred. And when I heard that, I kind of just rolled my eyes and didn't turn around because I had had enough of it at that point and the audience was being a little rowdy. But at a certain point, people started chanting and they wouldn't stop. So I turned back and I saw a girl smearing red paint all over her face, throwing it around and screaming about Milo along with five other girls. And at that point, everyone went crazy. People started standing up. People started chanting Black Lives Matter on one side of the room. And on the other side of the room, people started chanting for Trump. And for a full <laughs> five minutes, everyone was just going crazy. And Milo was cracking up on the stage, waiting, it all to, waiting for it all to stop. Um, they ended up leaving of their own accord, although they'd later insist that they were kicked out. And ironically, they left behind a beautiful red mess for the underpaid janitors to clean up. But the lecture went on, and probably an hour later, um, my, the, I heard from another Yale member that there would be protests outside. So my Yale president asked me to videotape them since they were vandalizing the venue and they smeared paint all over the windows to look like blood. And so I went outside with another Yale member, a male, and I started taping them with my iPhone. Um, as I was taping them, they decided to approach me as the female YAL member, not the YAL member, who, the male YAL member, and questioned why I was videotaping them. I couldn't actually answer because so many women had come up to me at once and put their hands in my face and started asking for permission waivers, which you don't need on public property. And amazingly, they got really offended that I wouldn't respect their wishes after they had just vandalized an event that I worked so hard for.
So I didn't say anything, kept taping, and one girl threatened to report me if their bodies were harmed because of the video, which made me chuckle a bit. And then I heard the phrase racist B word thrown out there. So I broke for a second and I asked, oh, did you just call me a racist B word? And then she said yes and repeated the word. And I was mildly disturbed, but I was pretty satisfied because I realized how genuinely absurd the protests were. So the event shook up my campus for a few weeks, but in a good way. I remember taking the bus home and thinking that it was the most uncomfortable night of my life. And I was really frightened after being called a racist bee for absolutely no reason, but I knew that it was going to be worth it by the next day. It was really comforting to be going through it with other members of Yale as well. So the next day, the, news, the school newspaper wrote about it. The campus Yik Yak was literally filled with comments about it. And the videos got posted on YouTube and it got hundreds of thousands of views. And luckily most people had seen that the protesters were really in the wrong. They confused Milo's conservative persona for hate speech, accused him of supporting the KKK even though he's a very flamboyant Greek man from Britain, and the ones who did agree with the protesters were ashamed by the way they acted. It made the anti-free speech left look terrible, and we were mentioned in the New York Post, Breitbart, and even on the Greg Gutfeld Show. So not all of my friends agreed with me, but one of my TAs approached me, who turned out to be a libertarian, and congratulated me and expressed a lot of support. Even one of my really intellectual leftist friends said that he felt alienated by the protests because he thought they represented an authoritarian side of the left that he didn't agree with. So if I were to give advice, I'd say that being politically active and helping to host a controversial speaker was the best thing I could have done my freshman year. Even though it wasn't always fun, the amount of support and attention that came afterwards made it absolutely worth it. That's it. Thank you, Andrea. And last but not least, we have Anna from Ohio University. Um, and then after Anna, we'll open it up to a few quick questions. Hi everyone, my name is Anna Lippincott and I'm a senior at Ohio University. Um, like all the ladies on the panel and all of you, I'm sure we've faced hardships for being conservatives on campus. Um, everyone else seems to handle everything pretty eloquently. I tend to just yell at people instead. Um, <laughs> so uh, when my father first dropped me off at college, his last words to me were, don't become a liberal. Um, <laughs> I kind of laughed at my dad. You know, I've always been a really strong conservative woman, um, and I was going to college. I wasn't moving to like communist China or anything. Um, what I didn't know, though, is I was in for a completely different world from everything that I was used to. So I grew up in Cleveland in the most suburbia way you can imagine. Uh, my parents raised me with conservative values, respect, honesty, integrity. Um, I went to Catholic school my whole life, church on Sundays. I worked hard both at school and in after school jobs too. But when I got to college, I immediately felt like I didn't fit in and it was a completely different world. Um, Ohio University is a little bit on the liberal side to say the least. Uh, our socialist club has more members than our conservative and liberal groups put together. Um, topless feminists walk around campus on Friday nights chanting with like no shirts on. Um, and a large percentage of students don't wear shoes to class. So um, protests are hardly even covered because when they happen every day, they stop being newsworthy. So needless to say, I experienced a little bit of culture shock. While we do have an aggressive liberal population though, they're hardly ever challenged. The liberal mindset is so indoctrinated into students at Ohio that no one bothers to stand up to them anymore, um, except for me. So. I learned very early on that I would never be friends with these people. Um, if I'm never going to be friends with the liberals on campus, I might as well try to stand up for my conservative values and try to spread the message. Since my freshman year, I've been going out of my way to combat liberal craziness on campus, and it's the most fun I've ever had. My freshman year, President Obama came to speak to us, um, and I made a video recording people in line waiting to see him and exposing their stupidity. Um, I asked a girl if she supported Obama because he supports the Trail of Tears, and she said yes. So, um, 
My sophomore year, our, uh, our corrupt liberal sheriff was indicted on 25 felony counts, so we organized a protest um, against his release, and he got so mad that he spit on us and was yelling at the, like us and the protesters, um, but the joke's on him because he's in prison for the next seven years. So. <laughs> My junior year, I helped expose a, the liberal gubernatorial candidate for being a womanizer. He had a really horrible track record of that. So I got a huge group of girls together and we protested him coming to Athens for the weekend. Um, and it made it onto news like all the way up in Cleveland, which was really cool. This year, I wrote a letter about the struggles of being a college conservative that got the attention of both staff and the administration. Um, I also worked hard to take the lessons that CBLPI taught me last summer. Um, and apply them directly to my campus. One way is I worked to bring Dr. Christina Hoff Summers to campus to give a lecture about rampant modern feminism, which was perfect for OU. Her lecture was great, and it was the highest attended lecture that we'd had all year. If you've ever considered bringing a speaker, I highly recommend it, and the women at CBLPI do so much to help make it happen. And it's a great way to just begin becoming involved in campus. So through CBLPI and campus funding, there are plenty of ways to make it happen, even if it doesn't seem possible. I think OU's funding was a little bit scared to say no to me. Um, I have a reputation for kind of making a big deal about things when I feel like I'm treated unfairly. Uh, you can just ask my dean. We're on a first name basis now. So. <laughs> Uh, this year, I also took an idea that Laurel had of getting girls together to bond over similar issues and similar um, interests. We do monthly girls' nights at my house, so I cook for all the underclassmen girls, and we just sit and talk and kind of just socialize as being conservative women. Um, I also invite any new girls to, um, of our conservative club to come have brunch on Sunday, um, mostly just because I like brunch but, <laughs> and need someone to go with me, but that was also an idea Laurel had. Um, Next week, we have our annual Women in Conservatism Day at school, where all the girls in our conservative club table and pass out literature all day and try to educate people on the facts of being a conservative woman. While I do face a great deal of opposition and criticism for my beliefs and my vocal approach to the um, conservative movement, I also take great pride in what I do. If I can offer any advice, it's to be vocal and stand tall with your beliefs. Don't try to cower behind them. You'll always face criticism for what you do. Like the amazing Claire Booth Luce said, no good deed goes unpunished. And don't worry what others have to say. They weren't going to be your friend anyway, so who cares? Instead, it's better to be loud and proud and a voice for those who might be too afraid to otherwise speak up. Set an example of boldness so that others will follow your lead. I can tell stories for days about the crazy things I've dealt with since coming to college. I've been verbally harassed, threatened to be run over by a truck, threatened to have dogs released on me. Uh, my advisor called me an oxymoron for being a female conservative. I actually had to file a police report once for online harassment and stalking. But after every hilarious incident I face, I just roll my eyes and laugh it off and keep doing what I've always been doing. I don't care what people think of me. I'm not going to cower down or stop fighting the good fight. I'll always be loud and proud for my beliefs, and I encourage you to do the same. It makes life uh, a little more enjoyable and a lot funnier. And my dad will be very pleased to know that coming to OU has made me the furthest thing from being a liberal. So. Thank you, Anna. Um, a lot of girls ask me, how do you combat bias on your campuses? And I think you do it just like all four of these girls did. You approach it with humor. You don't take it personally, um, and you just face it very boldly. You embrace it. You don't try and shrink away from it. So I'd like to open it up to all of you to ask questions of these four ladies. Maybe you have problems on your campus, and they can give you some insight into how they deal with things. First off, thanks so much for sharing your stories, guys. You guys are really brave, and it's very encouraging. So my question comes from a sh little short story. When I started at my school, it was pretty apolitical. No one really had strong opinions either way. In 2014, during the Hobby Lobby controversy, our president got us involved with the fight for religious liberties and hiring practices. And so the administration at my school is very conservative. The faculty and staff are very liberal, and the majority of students are very liberal. So it's created a very interesting climate. All of last year, there were a lot of protests for the pro-feminist movement and for marriage equality all over our campus. 
This year, they instituted protest zones, so you have to apply to protest, and you can put, be put in zones that fit roughly five people, and you could get rejected for protest. So what is your thoughts on protecting, this is for everyone, for protecting free speech on campus, even if it ultimately helps promote the liberal agenda? I mean, I'm always a proponent for free speech, regardless of what side it comes from. A um, small anecdote, uh, we had Bernie Sanders come to our campus uh, last semester, and uh, someone from the College of Republicans actually approached me and asked if we would be protesting the event. And I said, absolutely not, because why would we do to the liberals what we complain about them doing to us? It doesn't make any sense. As to protest zones, I think that's absurd. I mean, the First Amendment protects your right to petition, and to limit that is just uh, ridiculous. So I've always been taught to approach everything with humor. Um, so if you're having a problem with that, expose it. Expose how ridiculous it is. Write something about it. Um, if, you're, if you have a conservative group, post it on the group's blog or submit it to your campus newspaper. Um, expose it and then do something funny about it. So like we did the funeral for Halloween because the my culture is not a costume, is completely ridiculous. And we actually had a lot of people, both liberal and conservative, come up to us and tell us that what we did was completely reasonable for how ridiculous the campaign was. So um, I think that humor goes a long way with things like this. Um, to answer your question about um, how we should approach this, even though like the liberals are benefiting from like saying like insane things and moving people away from conservatism. Um, it's really important to support free speech because through free speech we have like the ability to participate in like intellectual discourse and like talk things through rather than people just silencing other opinions. I'd rather, I think that a campus where there's free speech and it's equally liberal and conservative is better than a campus where there's absolutely no free speech and everyone's conservative. Because to really know that you're conservative, you have to have your views challenged, you have to talk it out. And the thing that surprised me about the protests at my school is that they were protesting free speech and they were leftists. While like 60 years ago in Hollywood with McCarthyism, people were losing their jobs because they were, and Ronald Reagan actually like fought against that when he was the, um, the chair of the Screen Actors Guild. So like, the tables could turn, you know, people could be persecuted for being conservative. So um, we absolutely shouldn't support that infrastructure, even though it's real. I understand it's like really, really tough to hear some of the things people say. Um, I find the idea of a free speech zone absolutely hysterical. I assume you go to a private school. If you go to a public school, you can come and talk to me about like communication law because then we could really get something going with that. But um, I actually disagree with what Amber is saying about like protests and stuff. I love protests. I think they're hysterical. Um, so like, like it's one of my favorite things to do. So if there is a event, like an event, a big like liberal thing happening, like I encourage you to go out and protest. Kind of the way I see it is like if liberals want to play these stupid, silly games, I can play that too. You just have to play it better. So figure out how to get news coverage, figure out how to like get a lot of people there. It's going to look kind of silly if you have like two people protesting something, mm -hmm. but, um, I mean, you can play the games too, just make sure that you do them better. Excellent. And just to clarify my point, I definitely agree with protesting, yeah. just the idea of protesting and like shutting down the other side's speech. Right, right, yep. right. Right. Do we have another question? One of you mentioned um, that someone who was in your group that was putting on your event was um, go at, promoting it in a way that kind of disagreed with the values of um, what your group was talking about. Um, and I can kind of understand that completely because I'm in the College of Agriculture um, at my school and many of the people um, that I'm friends with and that are part of like the agricultural groups that I'm friends with or that I'm involved in, excuse me, um, are the kind of people that sometimes take it a little far to the right wing with how they're going about expressing their views. Um, I'm very much from a community that's kind of place where there are a lot of pickup trucks flying like the Confederate flag on them and that kind of thing. And it's not in an, an offensive way. It's just, I mean, I can totally understand how it can be, but that's not the intention of like what a lot of these kids are doing. Um, they're very educated people, but they also are like very proud to be from like small town America and like um, th that's just the values that they've grown up with and don't understand how it can always be taken so offensively. 
Um, but anyway, uh, a lot of the people that I'm surrounded by are very involved in like agricultural policy and have done a lot on Capitol Hill or at the state level to advocate for that, but don't go much outside of that in the realm of politics. So um, I know that there are people on campus who would love to support the conservative movement, and I know that there are a lot of people outside of my particular college that are um, have those views. I've seen them expressed in class and get shut down, of course, most of the time. But basically, I guess what I'm getting at is how do you find those people um, to join your groups when you're looking for them on campus? Because you know they're there, but there's a lot of like the closet conservatism where um, they might not be the ones stepping up and starting something like um, a Young America, Americans Foundation or a Turning Point or something of that sort. So how do you go about finding those people um, when you're wanting to get a group together to host these kind of events? And I guess the second part of that is how do you trust them to, um, to display that message in a classy way that um, we want to take on rather than some people that, um, like I know, might go a little extreme um, with what they're trying to convey? Um, so I have a problem with one of my members. Um, and it's not like the Confederate flag or like the classy way. He, he actually goes against conservative values. So we made an event page for my recent event and he was posting things on there like, are the, is there a time when trigger warnings are acceptable? Um, should we warn people about microaggression? And he was saying that there were times and nobody in our club agreed with that. And um, the speaker was Ben Shapiro, and of course he doesn't agree with that at all. So um, we had a lot of problems with that. And the night before our event, he actually posted something on our private, like our um, Young Americans for Freedoms group, like private page, and um, like saying how we needed to be more respectful about um, the way we go about things and that we were... Um, not trying to understand the other side and all of these ridiculous things. At one point, um, he cited the Sharon statement and was like using it in the wrong way and talking about like sometimes safe spaces are appropriate. So that was my problem. And I'm still trying to deal with this problem with this member because despite the fact that I've talked to him multiple times and the former chair Lauren has talked to him multiple times, he doesn't seem to understand this. Um, and it's really difficult to trust people if um, you're having like problems like that with your members. And um, I've found it very difficult to like trust members. Like we've added a bunch of people to our like email serve and stuff like that. And my members have tried to like add those people to our private Facebook page. And I don't do it unless I know that I can trust that person because I don't want something like the issue that I'm having now with somebody publicly going against like our group's values. Um, I'd like to address the first part of your question. You asked how to recruit closet conservatives. Um, in my experience, the best way is to con continue to be vocal and people will generally follow you. Um, just last week, I go to a Catholic university and um, they sent out an email reaffirming the right to life. And uh, a lot of students didn't take that very kindly and there were some Facebook statuses um, degrading that position. And so I decided to just comment and share my view as a, a pro-life woman. Um, and I had a couple of people message me afterwards and say, thank you so much for sharing that opinion because I was thinking it, but I was scared to express it. And um, just providing that example, I think can be very powerful for people to feel comfortable sharing their views that may not um, be widely accepted on campus. And in terms of um, having members that you um, may or may not trust, I've also had issues with that where a member of our board um, was sharing our private um, Republican board messages with actually the chair of the College Democrats. Um, and so that was a difficult situation. Um, it actually escalated to the point where we removed that board member from the um, group message. Um, and she was a friend of mine, so that made it uh, twice as hard. But um, I think you know integrity is really important. And so if you have someone in your group that doesn't have that value, then um, maybe that's someone you don't want to associate with. Right. Any more questions? Laurel, I actually have, do you mind if I answer that one too? Yep. Um, I, I kind of deal with something similar, I don't know. Oh, I kind of deal with something similar. Um, I'm in Southeastern Ohio, and obviously you're dealing with agriculture. Um, a lot of what people care about in Southeastern Ohio is fracking and energy rights and property rights and things. So what we've done to kind of recruit closet conservatives, because a lot of the people who are 
vocal are either from the environmental side or for the pro fracking, well, pretty much just the environmental side. Um, there aren't really a lot of pro fracking people besides, you know, our group. So we plan weeks. So like next week is conservative week for us where each day has a different theme to try to recruit people who might be drawn to that particular theme. So day one, we're doing um, getting government out of higher education funding. Day two, we're doing um, uh, fracking and we're throwing a global warming beach party. Um, uh, day three, we're doing Women in Conservatism Day. We're also, day four, we're doing an economics table day. And then day five, I can't remember off the top of my head what it is. So we have these different days planned so that people who are drawn to that, um, who are drawn to that, will go to that. Because maybe, you know, if you're really, in, if you're an economics major, you're interested in economics, you're not necessarily interested in fracking. Um, and that was also something I had to deal with members with. I'm the president of my conservative group, um, and I did have to like respect members. I really wanted to call our pro fracking day "Frack Lives Matter," but the rest <laughs> of my club didn't like that, so I had to respect them, and we had to change the name of it. So you do actually have to work with other people and stuff. But. All right, I think we have time for two more questions. Thank you so much for sh uh, sharing. It's very inspiring to hear what you guys are doing. Seriously appreciate it. Um, I don't know if any of you have seen, I was talking to Amber about this just uh, recently, but um, at Loyola Marymount, the Latino um, Student Union erected a, like it's like a cardboard wall, and it probably went from that side of the room to over there, and it was like in the center of campus. And um, they used spray paint to, um, they wrote Trump and then crossed out Trump. And this was a, um, you know, a school sanctioned thing. It was like their mural. Um, and then they wrote, you know, no human being is illegal, stop deportations, not, not one more. Um, and I guess during the night, someone came um, with spray paint and then wrote Trump, not crossed out, and then wrote um, deport more. And so there was a lot of backlash and they held like a, the school held like a church vigil for students who are, you know, illegal or who are the kids of um, illegal immigrants. And then the president sent um, an email out to everyone saying, you know, this is a, we value um, open discourse, um, you know, in regards to people coming back with their opinions. So basically the conservative opinion is getting shut out. And I'm really glad that I came today because I've been wanting to do something about it, but it just seems really hard because I think our, our LMU College Republicans has six members. And so I'm wondering like, how, what can I do? I know you said you sent a letter um, or you know, bring in a speaker. Um, what, like, what, what are the like, details behind doing this? Because I really wanna address this. So I've actually sent uh, either emails to my dean or even straight to the office of the president before just to make sure that, you know, even if they delete your email, at least you know that you're trying. And uh, at some point they might actually read what you have to say and take it to heart. Um, I think I recently wrote an email to the president about um, the Black Lives Matter sit-in movement trend at uh, college campuses, and I did receive a response, so at least I know that they're reading them. Um, Bringing speakers is a huge way. If you could actually find a speaker who will address that exact topic, which if you mention something that's happened specifically on your college campus when you're bringing a speaker, they're usually very happy to address it. Um, so definitely find someone who maybe focuses on um, immigration, and then they can talk specifically about like why that wall may, may have been problematic. Before I got involved in my club, Lauren brought Bay Buchanan to campus to talk about illegal immigration, and our funding actually got cut after the event because of the name of the event, um, which was Alien Invasion. So <laughs> um, props to Lauren. Um, she, so, but it didn't, like, that's one way. You maybe, you should look into bringing Bay to campus, because I know she did a really good job with her speech when I looked back on it. But we have this thing at school called Dream Week, and it's about illegal immigrants be, should be allowed to have all of the same privileges as citizens of the US. Um, that's the, basically the premise of the week. And we haven't done anything to address it yet, um, mostly because it was, I'm pretty sure it was like the week before our speaking event for this semester. But um, bringing speakers in does make a huge difference. Um, if you can work with your club, probably clear booth loose, it's something you should look into. Yeah, I would definitely bring in a speaker. It really does make a difference. Um, it's if 
I'm not sure, I haven't read the email, but if your president said that the school supported open discourse, that might be a good sign, because even though it feels like your views are being shut out, and it definitely sounds like, like they are, um, you definitely, you can like, um, I know people set up a free speech wall where they invite students to write whatever they want. Um, inviting a speaker. I'm not sure if you'd rather it be about immigration or free speech, but I know that there are a lot of speakers on those topics, so I would definitely um, invite one. Um, inviting a provocative one is good, I think, because it would really get the campus like um, engaged in conversation. And I think it's relatively easy. Um, I wasn't the one who invited Milo, but I know that in the binder there's a lot of information about how to invite a speaker, so I would really encourage that. Yeah, and then in, a, in addition, obviously, to bringing speakers, um, if it's hard because you go to a, a Catholic school, so immigration is like, you know, the Catholic Church is taking it on as an issue, so obviously that's difficult. But if they're encouraging open discourse, the first thing I would do, um, if the Latino student group got permission to build this wall, this mural, um, and write no Trump, get permission to build your own wall and write Trump on it, like, you know, do it, like, do the same thing that they did, um, and then try to set up a debate with them. Um, make it an open forum. Get a panel of three people from either side, from the Latino Student Union, and then you know whatever conservative group you're a part of about how we should tackle immigration, um, because that is starting discourse. And you know, facts don't lie. Like we'll win the argument every time. So. Um, in addition to like the president encouraging open forum, make sure that he's not being backhanded about it. Our president, or our campus recently hosted Charles Murray, and our president wrote a letter saying that we should continue after like there was petitioning to have him not come, um, that we should let him come and hear open ideas, even if they go against our beliefs and values and are wrong. So Charles Murray wrote him back and explained to him how he was wrong and un and uneducated about what Murray was going to speak on. So just make sure that your president is not being backhanded about it. And if he is, then write a letter about why he is being backhanded about it, and it will expose him and the administration. All right. I think that that is all the time we have.